everyone. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you because I have a problem, and it's no small problem. It's the challenge of popularising the area of paleontology that I work in, which is the very earliest mammals from the time of dinosaurs, or those Mesozoic ratty things, as other vertebrate paleontologists like to refer to them as. I'll start by saying that I am, of course, social media friendly, so please do tweet at me at GScienceLady, and as well as using the hashtag PopPaleo, please feel free to use the hashtag Mesozoic Mammals. So who am I? Briefly first, uh, so I am a mere PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and the National Museum of Scotland. But before I returned as a mature student, um, to, sorry, to study as a mature student, I worked for a conservation charity uh, with whales and dolphins. Now, in doing this, uh, my, the main role of my job is to speak to the public every day, so science communication, but right face to face. So I got asked a lot of very, very difficult and challenging questions, and I very often had to say to people, well, you know, actually, I, I can't tell you the answer to that, I'm going to have to go and look it up. And in doing so, realised that I was really interested in natural sciences in general, and hence returning to study. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because now that I work with metasoic mammals, um, yeah, what, basically when I work with whales and dolphins, if somebody said, what do you do? And I would tell them I work with whales and dolphins. Oh my God, their eyes would light up. Oh, you know, my uncle saw a dolphin in such and such a place, or oh, I saw one here, or did you see that David Attenborough documentary? Oh my God, you know, they can hold their breath as long and they can dive as deep. And they would talk to me non-stop for hours. Everyone loves dolphins. But now, when I say to people what I do, I mostly get, uh, so what's a metastatic mammal? Uh, because... I don't even use the term Mesozoic mammal anymore because generally, in the, sort of, in, in the public sphere, people don't know what the word Mesozoic means. And fair enough, why would you? And a lot of people actually aren't entirely positive what a mammal is either. So I tend to say, you know, uh, the earliest mammals from the time of dinosaurs. I have to talk around it a lot and I basically have to start from first principles every time I speak to somebody. And it's a huge barrier to me getting any further because you can only, people only have an attention span of so long and if you're just taking it up with telling them what it is in the first place, you just can't communicate more interesting stuff. So, this is why I have a problem. And it, of course, all Mesozoic mammal workers have the same problem. And I, I've been trying to think around this, why is it that Mesozoic mammals are so difficult to talk about? And so people say things to me like, oh, well, they all just look like rats. And, okay, well, granted, there's a little bit of truth in that. Uh, or they say to me that they're all just so tiny, you know, as if small things are not interesting. I mean, if that was the case, I'd be a rock star and Danny DeVito would be a nobody. Um, they say to me, the terminology is too difficult, but if anybody has worked with, uh, with kids and dinosaurs, they'll know that you know, little kids can learn the most complicated words and names. Terminology shouldn't be a barrier if you do it right. Um, and they say to me, oh, it's all just teeth and there's, there's no complete fossils. Here's a selection of some of these beautiful teeth that I've been looking at over the last year. And there, there are a lot of teeth historically, but I want to show you today that None of these things are really quite true anymore, and that we're really seeing a renaissance in the study of Mesozoic mammals and therefore in their popularisation. So, in this talk, I can't obviously cover everything, so I'm just going to touch briefly on a little bit of the history of Mesozoic mammals, how they're seen in popular culture, science communication, and luckily, in talks over the last day, a lot of my work has been done for me because a lot of people have already brought half the things I was going to say up, so that's great. Um, and of course, I can't not talk about paleo art, because I think it's really hugely important. And ultimately, I want to try and answer or try and help move towards what can be done to popularise Mesozoic mammals. So let's start at the beginning. I'm sure all of you are uh, familiar with the eccentric Reverend William Buckland from the early 1800s, who discovered the first published dinosaur fossil, this Megalosaurus. But what a lot of people don't realise is that he also discovered the very first Mesozoic mammals. And in his paper on Megalosaurus, or his notice on uh, the great fossil lizard of Stonesfield, on page two, bottom paragraph, he also talks about the other animals that are found at Stonesfield that, he says, are not less extraordinary than the Megalosaurus. And what he found was a jaw, which he showed to Georges Cuvier, who we've also mentioned in previous talks, who's one of the greatest comparative anatomists at the time, who um, wrongly identified it as a marsupial, but who can blame him? Nobody had found any of these creatures before. Um, and Buckland says here, I should have hesitated to announce such a fact because it forms a case hitherto unique in the discoveries of geology. Because this really was something really special, really new. And in fact, Cuvier and Owen both thought that he'd made a mistake. And it wasn't even from the Triassic. It must be later. But you just don't have mammals back then. Um, but part of the problem, I think, is, and this is a recurring theme for Mesozoic mammals, 
is that they quite often found alongside dinosaurs. And I think it was Mark Carnell yesterday who said that there's a tendency to focus not on perhaps what's most scientifically important uh, in each geological period, but what's the most exciting. And I admit, dinosaurs are exciting. I love them too. Uh, but it also doesn't help that it was uh, illustrated, like, look, these are the kinds of illustrations of these jaws. I mean, compare that to that Megalosaurus jaw you just saw earlier. This is a crap drawing by comparison. That Megalosaurus is <laughs> And the thing is, the specimen itself is gorgeous. This is a photograph I took of it recently at the National History Museum, and it deserves that detailed kind of art, but it just didn't get it. Um, so yeah, overshadowed. And this we see, I'm going to cherry pick another example of this. Um, almost 100 years later, when uh, the American Museum of Natural History went to Mongolia, and they found, uh, of course, all these dinosaur eggs, so the whole world went crazy with these dinosaur eggs. But they did also find mammals. And, William Gregory tried to do, I guess, a cyclone piece, I don't know if you would call it that, um, where he tried to get people interested in these. And he describes them, again, as perhaps the most valuable fossils discovered so far. So scientists know these are important. But um, despite the beautiful pictures he puts in there, the really lovely photographs and nice uh, sort of diagrams reconstructing these animals, it just doesn't carry with the public the same way. However, here's where I want to criticise him and many, I think, uh, mammal workers. He has six pages of text and he dedicates four of those pages to teeth and their evolution with cryptic diagrams like this, which wouldn't look out of place on the inside of an alien spaceship. I mean, really, even I find this boring. I'm not interested in this kind of stuff. I, I hate teeth. I just have to work with them because I'm a with mammal worker. But this is something which is going to change. And I should point out that no matter how happy your molars might look, the public doesn't want to hear about teeth because teeth are not as exciting. But I'm going to come back to how that's changing uh, in my next slide. Now, I've got to talk about museums. I don't want to pick on museums here because I love them. But if anybody has ever looked for the Mesozoic Mammal section in the museum, I think you're going to find yourself slightly disappointed. Um, so I'm going to pick on one museum, and it's my favourite one, the one I work for, the uh, National Museum of Scotland, and I'm going to share with you their extensive Mesozoic Mammal uh, exhibition. Here it is. Oh, can you not see? Look, look, there it is, right there. In fact, let me zoom in. There it is. There's their Mesozoic Mammal. Um, in fact, that's pretty much it. You have to wedge yourself around the corner to get a look at the back end of this reconstructed Morgan Eucadon. And okay, so they've also stuck a sticker in front saying, oh, by the way, jaws changed. Uh, but, you know, this is hardly going to get kids going, oh, mummy, dad, and I want to work with Mesozoic mammals. Um, and I think that this, although it's challenging to popularise them, it can be done. And here's a really simple example. It's, it's a bit old school, but recently I went to the Paleontology Museum in Munich, and, as I say, a very old school display they have, but they've at least tried to do something. They've got the actual teeth, which you can see are, yes, they are incredibly tiny, uh, but they've put them on plinths as close to the glass as possible so you could peer down at them and they've blown up the pictures. Now, as I say, very old school, they've done the same thing with the jaw here and they've also laid out some little bones. But technology has moved on since they made this display. And so museums should now be seeing the opportunity, for example, of three-dimensional printing. So this is my favourite example. Um, it's written by a friend of mine, Roger Close. He and I and several others are now working on the Isle of Skye on the microvertebrate fossils he found there. And he found this, which is Paleoxonodon, um, a Mesozoic mammal that has been known for a while, but only from individual teeth. So he found the first teeth jaw. And he wrote the paper on it, he CT scanned it, and did this beautiful image, but he went one step further. And he also made a 3D model that you can actually go online and you can buy one if you want. It's only about 20 quid. Um, and I've actually brought one here to show you what it's like. Um, and I'll pass this around later, it's relatively sturdy, don't drop it. Um, and this to me is the kind of future of how to popularise Mesozoic mammals, because they are so small, and I'm not going to lie, a lot of them are very little, but when you see them this big and you can feel how sharp the teeth are, and you can really see that if this was the size of a dinosaur, really terrifying, it's kind of exciting, and kids love it. And we can take this sort of thing one step further. The Field Museum have done this uh, fantastic 3D print your own cheetah. They scanned a dead cheetah, of course. Um, they sectioned it out and they created this 3D print. Now imagine here, Mesozoic mammals, I think, Mesozoic mammals have an advantage because they're so small. You could print a life-size uh, replica of your Mesozoic mammal. I mean, this, to me, is the kind of future of where science communication can go uh, for Mesozoic mammals. All right, paleo art. 
when I was talking to my husband about doing this talk, and we were brainstorming and stuff, and he said, you know what the problem with Mesozoic mammals is? They don't have recognisable silhouettes. I have thought it's a bit of a weird thing to say, but actually, I think he's onto something. And I'd like you to indulge me and play a little game. I'm going to show you some silhouettes of some, I think, quite recognisable animals. And um, I'd like you to shout out if you can tell me what they are. And you get bonus points. I would say I'd buy you a drink, but we're not going out. I'm going home on the plane, so ha ha. Um, if you can name what film they're from as well. So here's your first one. Yeah, it's a Jurassic Park Tyrannosaurus. Easy one, iconic Tyrannosaurus Rex from Jurassic Park. Anybody? Anybody know the film? Jurassic Park as well, yeah. yeah. There's a theme going on here. Uh, and finally? So, apart from proving that Darren watches too many films, this also proves that, um, you know, they have recognisable shapes and outlines. They're really, really easy. And even if they're drawn badly, we talk about bad paleo art, but I think part of the reason that bad paleo art exists is because even if it's really bad, everybody knows what you're talking about. They still recognise it. But if we extend this to small mammals, anybody? No, it's something alive today. No, it's something alive today. Anyone? It's, it's actually a rat, um, and if you can tell me what film it's from, I'll be mightily impressed. <laughs> How could you not have recognised the famous rat from the abyss? Come on, people! So, so you can see it doesn't really work for mesozoic mammals. Um, at least it didn't, but I do think this is changing. Here is a diagram from the War 2007, illustrated by April Meander. And here you can see that I'm not the only one that's noticed this, or my husband is not the only one that's noticed this, because Ethan Meander has just used silhouettes. And what she's realised, and many others are realising, is that we now know enough about Mesozoic mammals that, okay, they look a lot like modern mammals, but if you know it's Mesozoic, and you then see that it has, for example, the patagiums, well, it's obviously got to be the last ethereum along at the end there. How could you not know? If it looks like a, a beaver slash otter, well, it must be Castor Ricotta. There is a kind of feature in this. I mean, obviously, they're not popular at the moment, but this is where I see it going. And I want to briefly mention uh, April Leander and Luo because the work they're doing at the moment at the University of Chicago is kind of at the cutting edge of popularising mes Mesozoic mammals. Sheshi is actually one of my supervisors, um, so it's a bit of a plug for him too, but he is really, really into popular science communication. He really thinks it's very, very important. So as well as being responsible for, for most of the most important papers in the last 20 years, he also is really keen to get people like, there's April there in the top corner, um, to get people doing good art that illustrates it to the public so they can imagine these animals in their setting. Um, so, paleo art. I think we've come a long way since uh, H.R. Knight's Nebula to Man, in which Mesozoic mammals were platypuses being eaten by crocodiles while being watched over by pteranodons. So at least we've moved some of the way uh, on there, but a lot of it is still very much in the context of what mammals are doing in relation to dinosaurs. This famous one, I'm sure everyone's seen. So very often they're depicted as dinosaur food. Um, or, of course, baring their teeth, because traditionally that's what we've all, we only had, is teeth and jaws. They're always snarling, which is a bit weird, because I can't remember the last time I saw a mouse snarl. But, uh, they're also often depicted creeping around the place, or um, creeping around the place. In fact, they're quite often creeping around the place. In fact, they're pretty much always depicted creeping around the place, as if this is all they do. I mean, where, where are the grooming? Where's the grooming? Where's the social interaction? They do a lot more stuff than just creeping about. And people will argue, well, <clears throat> the reason why art has been like this in the past is because we've just only had teeth and nothing else to go on. But I want to show you that this is no longer true, because since, well, basically the last 20 years since fossils have been coming out of China, we now have an extensive, complete, uh, se sorry, se section, no, selection of complete skeletons. I mean, this is just the ones I could find in half an hour on Google. I mean, really, there are just so many now. And because of this, we can tell so much more about them. We can put them in their ecological context. We can say whether they were diggers, whether they were flyers, whether they were uh, living in trees. Uh, some of you might, I don't know how familiar you are with these, with these individuals here, but I'll pick one out. So I recently had to do a talk for kids at the Edinburgh Science Festival, and I chose four that I thought had good stories. And we were talking about giving a narrative and giving a story behind them. So this one here, for example, is Doko Fosser, and it's basically a mole from the Mesozoic. And I had the whole room full of five-year-olds shouting out, 
dope of water at the top of their lungs. In fact, they even shouted out Vlatic Ethereum at the top of their lungs. So language and people saying, oh, the terminology, it's not actually a barrier. It's just you have to get the stories out there and you have to get the words familiar to people. And as for size, well, yes, they were all small, but this is an illustration that was just using uh, JAWS to show you that there is a variation in size. They're not all the same size. I just thought I should say that because uh, people are dismissive of the size thing. But they were, they were tiny ones, but they were also pretty chunky guys too. The scale bar there is two centimetres, so you're looking at things that have JAWS about that big. So, I don't know, badger size? That's not bad. And I think we shouldn't be surprised to think that they are a lot more interesting than we give them credit for. Because if you look at small animals today, they have a huge range of, uh, of habitats that they live in, of modes of life, of pelage. They have very, very different coats. I mean, this side over here, that's just wacky. And they've got weird ears and they've got spines. I mean, they're way more interesting than we've been giving them credit for. And I'd like to see this reflected in paleo art. Here's some really good examples of paleo art showing animals doing more than just snarling and peeping. Um, so I hope, in the course of this talk, that I've proved to you somewhat that they're actually morphologically diverse and there's a range of sizes and that they don't have to be complicated and the terminology shouldn't put people off and that there are now lots of great fossils, which I think is great news for popularising them. And ultimately, these are the three things that we need for, for helping to popularise Mesozoic mammals or mammals from the time of dinosaurs, because obviously dinosaurs are at the touch point. Um, and I was really grateful that your talk was on before mine because my final slide, funnily enough, was G.T. Simpson. And I wanted to leave you with his quote that, uh, that I shared recently uh, online. There were giants and yet there were also dwarves. Less awesome and pretentious, but more significant than their reptile lords. And theirs was the promise of the meek. They were to inherit the earth. And I really would hope that today I've changed your mind about how interesting mammals are. Thank you.